When starting out in the world of retro gaming, choosing the right cable can be really overwhelming. Are some cables really that much better than others? How come some support more resolutions than others? And what the heck is a SCART connector? This video hopes to clarify that, as well as give you other info you'll need to get started connecting your classic consoles to both old and new TVs. This video is going to go over different cable output choices for classic video game consoles. The first half of the video is going to go over everything you would need to get started, and then the second half is going to dive into some more of the nerdier stuff. So you could drop off after we get to the basics, I'll let everybody know then. But if you really want to know more of why some of these cables are used and the dangers of using certain types, stick all the way through to the end. Also, I'll soon have videos covering exactly what cable and what output solution is the best for each individual console, but this video is just going to be more of a general cable type, signal type video. If you'd like a quick recommendation, I'll suggest just getting cables for whatever equipment you already own. Check the back of your CRTs to see what kind of inputs it supports and get those. Or if you plan on using a flat panel, get cables that match the scaler you plan on using, since you'll always need a scaler when connecting classic consoles to flat panels. One more thing to mention is regardless of what cable you decide to use, you need to be realistic about price. Cables you find on AliExpress for a dollar are not cables you should be using. Check links on RetroRGB.com if you want good recommendations. Okay, let's check out all the different cables you could use. The first cable you might see for most classic gaming consoles is RF, which is basically broadcasting an analog TV signal down the cable to your TV's coax input. This is the lowest quality of all the cables, and it only allows for mono audio. But if it's your only plug and play choice, like with the Atari 2600, you could make it work. Unless you live in a big city with lots of wireless interference, RF would look pretty clean on many CRTs. Unfortunately, if you live in a crowded place surrounded by wireless interference like New York City, it looks like you see it here. While RF with CRTs is fine, I'd try not to use it on a flat panel unless there aren't any other options. If you do end up connecting RF to a modern TV, definitely use a scaler and don't just plug it directly into the TV's input. One cool trick for use with scalers, you could pick up an old VCR and convert the signal there. Just connect the console to the RF input, set the VCR's TV channel to match the console, then connect the audio and composite video output of the VCR to your scaler. Once again, using RF on modern TVs isn't the best method, but it'll work fine in a pinch. The next cable is the one that's most commonly found with classic game consoles, the yellow composite video cable. If you're using a CRT, this will get you a great output, and unlike RF, you don't need to worry about outside factors. Just plug it in and it'll work just like the original developers intended. If you're using an AV cable like this, that means you could also take advantage of stereo audio from consoles that support it. The NES and Sega Master System are mono, but pretty much all other consoles after that output in stereo. One other cool bonus of composite video is that while it's not the sharpest signal, some game developers used that blurriness to create some really nice effects. Check out the orb in this video using a cable that supports a sharper video output and now look at it with composite video. Even though it's not as sharp as other options, there's lots to appreciate when using composite on CRTs. When using them on flat panels, it's a bit different though. You'll definitely want to run it through a proper scaler. I really like the RetroTank Minis, and the RetroTank 5X is even better. There's some more options coming soon as well. Just stay away from any cheap boxes that were designed for VCRs, not video games. They'll add a ton of lag and process the image wrong. The next signal to talk about is S-Video, and it's probably the biggest jump in quality between signals. If your console supports S-Video, it'll look really sharp on a CRT, and even scales very well to modern TVs with the right device. Just like with composite video, if you connect S-Video directly to your flat panel, it'll probably look wrong and be really laggy. The retro tinks are once again a great choice, and you'll end up with an excellent image. The only issue with S-Video is not all consoles support it. 
SNES, N64, PlayStation, and many others do support S-Video simply by buying the right cable. Consoles like the NES only support composite video natively, and while the Genesis and SMS support RGB, they don't make an S-Video cable for it. Okay, so at this point, if your consoles are from the 90s or earlier, you don't need to go any farther. You could just use whatever cable your console came with through something like a RetroTINK, or maybe even look to see if an S-Video cable is available. You can get an even better picture by using component video or RGB though. In the context of retro gaming, these signals are equal in quality, but not directly compatible. I'll go over the basics of them both, and I'll start with component video as it's easier. Component video is a higher quality signal than S-Video, and it also supports higher resolutions. If you're using consoles like the PS2, GameCube, Wii, and original Xbox, you could set the output to 480p and get an image that looks great on modern TVs. As with all other analog video signals, it's best to skip your TV's component video inputs and convert that signal to HDMI. If your console can output 480p all the time like with the Wii, just a cheap zero lag analog to digital converter will work perfectly. Consoles like the PS2 have mostly 480i games though, so you'll want a scaler to handle those signals as well, otherwise your TV will add a lot of lag. The OSSC, RetroTINK 5X, and GBS Control are the best devices currently on the market for the PS2, with more to come. Okay, so here's where things get a little more complicated. What the heck is this connector? I'll first go over the basics, then go through some of the details and try to clear up some of the confusion that surrounds it. This is a SCART connector, which was primarily used in Europe, and Japan had a cable that looked similar called JP21, but was not compatible with SCART. This weird and awesome cable can carry multiple signals, including composite video, stereo audio, and the highest quality signal many of these older consoles output, RGB. The console section of RetroRGB.com has info on almost every console, as well as links to the proper cable for each model. If your console supports RGB from the factory, upgrading to this signal is as easy as just plugging in a new cable. If not, you might need to install a mod to get RGB, and that's up to you if you'd like to go through that extra effort to gain more sharpness. Also, there's cables designed that convert RGB to component video. Their performance is identical to the best types of SCART cables, and these could be a big help with compatibility if your equipment only supports component video. And that brings us to the first problem with RGB. How do you integrate it into your setup along with all of your other consoles and output choices? This question is definitely worthy of its own video, but I'll say this. Trying to build a setup that incorporates RGB along with component video, S-video, and composite video could be a real challenge, and some people might find it easier overall to just stick with one signal and buy a switch that matches. We'll follow up with this again at a future time, though. And now for the second potential problem with RGB SCAR cables. What if they're built wrong? Now, I'd like to put your mind at ease and say that if you've purchased any cables through links on RetroRGB.com and they're working for you, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that they're absolutely perfect and you have nothing to worry about. If you have a bit of OCD with your electronics like I do, you could check out a video I made that shows you how to check your cables using a cheap multimeter. If not, just make sure you stick with the links on RetroRGB and not be tempted to buy some $2 option on a random site. If your cables are built wrong, they can potentially damage your SCART equipment. And to demonstrate why, here's where we need to start getting nerdy. Now, if you just came here for recommendations on signal types and different cables for retro consoles, you're pretty much all set, and please consider subscribing to the channel and checking out all of the other videos and work that we do. But if you want an explanation of why there's some controversy over different SCART cable types, or what's really the difference between SCART and component video from a signal and safety standpoint, strap in, because we're going to go through all of it. Hey everybody, just a quick interruption to let you know that this is sponsored by you. All of the projects that I'm involved in are sponsored directly by support from the retro gaming scene, and if you'd like to find out how to support even at no cost to you, please check out the link below. Thanks, and back to it. Cables like composite and S-Video are just conductors wrapped in shielding with a connector on the end. If you buy cables that aren't shielded, they'll output a much lower quality image, but they won't damage your equipment. On the other hand, most RGB SCART cables contain components. Wait, what the heck? Why are there components 
in the cable. Cost. See, console manufacturers knew that 99% of the people using these would be using RF or composite video. So they thought, why put the components for RGB SCART, something that not many people would actually be using in the motherboard itself, and instead included those components in the cables? While this sounds pretty dumb and greedy at first, I actually agree with the decision. Nintendo sold almost 50 million Super Nintendos worldwide, and if they spent just 20 cents on more components to support RGB, that's about $10 million lost for a feature most people would have never used. Depending on your console and how badly the cable is built, you're not just ending up with a signal that looks bad, you could actually have a signal that's outputting a much higher voltage than SCART equipment is designed to handle. It's not just the main video signals that have potential for problems, though. There's also sync to worry about. See, RGB cables are technically RGBS cables. The video and brightness information is sent down each individual color line, then the horizontal and vertical alignment of the image is sent through one line called sync. I'll go over RGB signals in another video, but let's talk a moment about sync. The SCART standard calls for using composite video as sync, which is what all of these console manufacturers used in their cables. Yep, that's right, composite video, the same yellow cable signal that we've been talking about this whole time. That's for two reasons. First, someone could buy an RGB SCART cable for their console, but if their Japanese or European TV only supported composite video through their SCART port, it would still work. This is actually something that comes in handy today as well, since devices like the RetroTINK 5X can support both RGB and composite over SCART. The next is safety. Here's a color pattern to demonstrate. And here's how composite video looks on an oscilloscope when that color pattern is being displayed. You can see all of the color and brightness information on top, then that square wave at the bottom, which is just the sync portion of that signal. This is all part of the composite video standard, and all SCART devices are designed to accept this signal. Because of the safety and the neat bonus of also passing composite video, everyone probably should have been using composite video as sync if the cable was properly shielded. If it's built right, everything will look perfect, but if it's not, you'll get a lot of interference on the screen. As a result, many people started to look for an alternative to using composite video as sync, as that was much cheaper and easier than building fully shielded cables. One alternative was to use one of the two signals available in S-Video. As you can see here, just like with composite video, there is a sync signal embedded in Luma. The color information is all separated into the chroma line, making the only information contained in Luma brightness and sync so you don't have to worry about the color signals causing interference. To make things even more confusing, many of these consoles outputted just the sync signal from one of the pins on their multi-out, but it's never the exact same between consoles. Each one would need different components on the line, and depending on the region, you could have a console that outputs sync on one pin and pure voltage on that same pin from a different region. It's weird that they did this because none of these C-Sync signals ever conformed to an existing video standard, and in fact, Sony never added it to any of their PlayStation consoles that outputted analog video at all. But it's there, so people decided to use it. I mean, at first, that seems like a perfectly good idea. If the RGB SCART standard only needs that little bit of sync information, why bother sending anything else down the line? And if your cable is built with the exact correct components, it's perfectly safe to use and even compatible with some non-SCART devices like certain BNC switches or video production monitors that require only sync on the fourth line with no other information. So what's the problem with just using C-Sync then? Once again, badly made cables with improper components and some confusing terms. In the context of retro gaming, the sync information is called composite sync, or C-Sync for short. That's just the sync information, but I assume that the addition of composite video to the signal name is referring to the fact that just the C-Sync signal should be the same voltage as just the part of sync from composite video, so composite sync. Now, for the cost reasons mentioned before, most manufacturers didn't include the necessary resistors and capacitors required to shape the signal properly on the motherboard itself. If you pull this sync from a console without the correct components in the cable, 
you'll usually end up with a much higher voltage signal that could potentially kill SCART equipment. Even if it does work, without the right components, you might still have weird issues on screen. This higher voltage sync is often referred to as TTL sync, and in the context of gaming, you'll see this used with VGA signals. VGA is actually RGB-HV, the horizontal and vertical sync signals separate, all outputting at a higher voltage. This is perfectly safe and part of the VGA standard, but too high of a voltage for the SCART standard. And there's one last bit of confusion to throw into the mix, sync strippers. If you're connecting these RGBS signals to non-SCART devices, there's a chance they'll require C-Sync or TTL, and using a sync stripper is a good way to accomplish that. You'll sometimes see them in SCART heads like shown here, but that's usually for people using a SCART to BNC adapter. So the target device isn't actually SCART in that case. Sync strippers should only be used by experts who have a clear understanding of why you need to use them and how to implement them. They're never needed with SCART equipment, so why do we still hear so much about them? Well, first, a few cable manufacturers would refer to some cables with sync strippers in them as C-Sync cables. So lots of people bought them without realizing there was a stripper in there. Technically, they did output C-Sync if built correctly. But if built wrong, they'd actually output TTL and become a potential hazard. Once again, going back to making sure you have properly built cables. Also, many years ago, some people tried using them to fix certain issues that were best cured in other ways. People in the scene, as well as cable manufacturers, learned what components were really required and stopped using them as band-aids. And the last thing to mention is a type of sync called Sync on Green, or RGSB. You'll only ever see this with PlayStation 2s when they're outputting 480p in RGB mode, and it's rare that you'll need to use it at all. I'll go over PlayStation 2 outputs in a different video, but unless you have a very specific need for RGB, just get component video cables and use it from that output from the PS2. So hopefully this video summed up everything you'd need to know about different signals and cable types from classic consoles, and I also hope it cleared up some of the misconceptions of the dangers of RGB SCART. But overall, as long as you buy good cables from reputable resellers, you really shouldn't have to worry about any safety issues. To be honest, it's kind of upsetting that we have to deal with this at all. I mean, cables are supposed to just be conductors with connectors on the end of them, and you should never have to worry about circuits. But unfortunately, that's just the way it is with RGB SCART, so it's something we have to deal with. All right, before we go, here's a quick summary of what to get when choosing analog video cables for your classic consoles. If your console supports 480p or above, use component video, otherwise you'll be limited to lower resolutions. If your console is from the 90s or earlier, just use whatever's easiest. Most people will use composite video, since that's what they probably already own. Some people will upgrade to S-Video when that's available, and that's perfectly safe in all scenarios. But if you're chasing the sharpest signal from those classic consoles, check out RetroRGB.com for info on the exact RGB SCART or component video cables that match each console and region. Your choice of SCART or component should only be dictated by what's easiest to integrate in your setup. Quality and functionality are identical, provided you buy cables that are well made. Just remember that, like with badly made SCART cables, if you pick up a poorly made RGB to component video cable, all of the potential safety concerns still apply. So once again, stay away from knockoffs and make sure to buy good quality cables. I'll always keep the links updated on Retro RGB to the best of my ability, but just make sure to read each page and buy the cable that matches your console and region. If for whatever reason you can't get the RGB SCART cables linked there, just get shielded cables that use composite video as sync to be safe. If you like this video and want to learn more about retro gaming, subscribe to this channel and consider signing up for any of my support services. Also, if you'd like to be kept in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, check out the weekly podcast available as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found.